am presenting Union Gospel Presses Sunday School Lesson number 8, Sunday, July 25th, 2021. The lesson is entitled, Esther Goes Before the King. Lesson text comes from Esther chapter 4, verses 6 through chapter 5, verse 2. Related scriptures are Esther chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. 3, chapter, chapter 3, verses 1 through chapter 4, verse 5. Chapter 5, verse 3 through chapter 7, verse 10. Proverbs 21, 1. The place is in Shushan. The time is 474 BC. Have you ever been in a situation that could accurately be described as desperate? Such occasions can make us feel hopeless at times. Followers of the Lord throughout the ages have found themselves in life or death circumstances because of the hatred the world has for the gospel message they carry and proclaim. It might not be as evident where we are as it is in other places around the globe, but the persecution of Christians is still very real. The good news for believers who feel desperate is that God hears their cries for help and cares for them. Psalms 31 through 3, 41 through 2. Conditions that may be overwhelming to us are no match for the Lord. No problem is too difficult for him to handle. In fact, no problem is difficult for him at all. He can intervene on behalf of his people even in times of national calamity. Today's aim, facts. To understand that as God's people, we are sometimes put in desperate situations beyond our control. Principle, to rejoice that distressing situations do not mean hopelessness to those who trust in Christ. Application, to remember that when we feel desperate or helpless, we will never go wrong by turning to the Lord. Illustrating the lesson. We who know the Lord always have hope in him, even in the most desperate situations. Practical points. One, wherever we are, God can use us to help others. Esther 4, 6 through 7. Two, it is never wrong to urge others to do the right thing. Verse 8. Three, God does not ask his people to deny the presence of danger, but to trust him in that danger. Verses 9 through 12. Four, God places each of us in the time and place where we can best accomplish his purposes, verses 13 through 14. Five, believers need to support each other as a family of faith in times of trial, verses 15 through 17. Six, God often answers prayers through people who are willing to act boldly in obedience to him, 5, 1 through 2. Golden text. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. Esther 4, 16. Today we have three lesson outlines. The first is learning of a godly threat, Esther 4, 6 through 9. The second is wrestling with personal responsibility, Esther 4, 10 through 17. And the third is receiving the king's favor, Esther 5, 1 through 2. Introduction. Genocide has become one of the baleful realities of the 20th and 21st centuries. Everyone is aware of the most infamous example, the Nazi extermination of Jews and other groups during the Second World War. But that was not the first in the long line of massacres. During the First World War, Armenians living in Turkish-held regions suffered catastrophic losses. Imperial Japan sent many to the slaughter in the 1930s and 40s. Estimates still vary regarding the millions put to death in the Soviet Union under Stalin. The Book of Esther recounts an early example of state-sponsored genocide that thankfully was thwarted. Because of the bravery and faith of two individuals, a diabolically planned and decreed massacre of Jewish people across the Persian Empire never took place. Learning of a deadly threat. Esther 4.6 So Hatak, 
went forth to Mordecai unto the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. Verse 7. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him, and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Verse 8. Also he gave him uh, gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make requests before him for her people. Verse 9, And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Esther was a young Jewish woman living in Shusha, one of the royal cities of the Persian emperor. She had been raised by her much older cousin Mordecai, Esther 2, 5-7, and in probably but providentially had been elevated to become queen to King Ahiurus, known to history as Xerxes, in place of the disposed first queen, verse 17. On, Mordecai, on Mordecai's advice, Esther kept her Jewish background hidden, verse 20. The king installed a wretchedly thin-skinned prime minister named Haman, 3-1, who quickly developed an in intense hatred for Mordecai because of his refusal to show the usual respect by bowing in his presence. Learning that this was because of Mordecai's Jewish identity, Haman decided that the empire needed to be rid of all its Jews. He hatched a plot to have them slaughtered everywhere on a specific day, verses 4 through 7, and obtained the king's approval, which meant the decree was unalterable, verses 8 through 15. When Mordecai learned of the decree, he put on mourning clothes and raised a great cry in the midst of the city of Shushan, 4, 1 through 3. News of this soon came to Esther's attention, and she dispatched an attendant to find out the reason for Mordecai's distress, verses 4 through 5. It was a distress she soon would be sharing herself. Mordecai's report on the plot, Esther 4, 6 through 7. Esther's attendant, Hatak, found Mordecai in the city square in front of the palace gate. He would not have been hard to spot wearing the typical mourning garb of sackcloth dusted with ashes. Mordecai did not hesitate to report all that had recently happened, including the detail of how much money Haman was willing to pay into the treasury to fund the slaughter. But he did not stop with a bare accounting of facts. Here was undoubtedly his only opportunity to do something about the looming disaster. Mordecai's request to Esther. Esther 4, 8 through 9. Mordecai showed that he was not merely reacting to hearsay or rumors. He supplied Hatak with a copy of the decree for the empire-wide slaughter issued at Shushan and asked him to show it to Esther. That alone would put her in an awkward position since the decree had been approved by her husband. But what he instructed Hatak to say next would ratchet up the tension she was under even more. Mordecai requested that Hatak carefully explain the decree to Esther so that there would be no misunderstanding on her part. He did not want to leave any room for confusion for he had a difficult task in mind for her. Hatak was to urge Esther in the strongest terms, charge in verse 8 typically carries the force of a command an order or a commission to approach the king to beg for mercy, make supplication unto, unto him for her people. Two things should be noted here. First, Mordecai did not ask Esther to beg the king to rescind the decree. He understood enough about the laws of the Medes and Persians to know that a royal decree with the king's seal on it could not be altered. Esther 8.8, 8, Daniel 6.8, 12.8. 15. What Mordecai undoubtedly hoped for was that the king would show mercy by ordering countermeasures that would prevent the decree from being carried out. And as we see later in the book, that is exactly what happened. 
Second, Mordecai knew that Esther had kept her Jewish identity hidden. He himself had advised it, so he knew it would be awkward and risky for her to now reveal that the ones who were earmarked for slaughter were her people. Who could say what the king's reaction would be when he learned that his queen was a Jew and that she had kept this secret from him? Mordecai knew he was not making a light request of his cousin, but the situation demanded it. He was unaware, however, of an additional factor that made this charge actually perilous for Esther to carry out. Esther 4.9 tersely reports that Hatak returned and duly conveyed Mordecai's message to Esther. The ball was now in her court, wrestling with personal responsibility. Verse 10, again, Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. Verse 11, all the king's servants and the people of the king's province do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live, but I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days, verse 12. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words, verse 13. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews, verse 14. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Verse 15. Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Verse 16. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. Verse 17. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Esther's Dilemma. Esther 4, 10 through 12. Esther's response was to send Hatak back to Mordecai with a return message. She wanted to make her cousin aware of the severe danger his charge put her in, no doubt in the hope that he would realize he was asking too much of her and find some other way of dealing with the problem. It was a natural response and one that probably any of us would make under the circumstances. Esther, of course, surely wanted to see her people rescued from slaughter, but she needed Mordecai to be aware of one fact of life in the royal court that everyone connected to it knew about and always kept in mind. No matter who you were, you did not simply walk into the king's presence uninvited. You had to be summoned. It was an in, in, inflexible rule, and it carried a single penalty for violation, instant death. This was a standing rule and the penalty was automatic, but the king could grant an exception if he so desired. If he held out his golden scepter toward the person who had entered his intercourt without authorization, that person was assured of royal favor and would live. But this was entirely up to the king's whim and few, if any, would dare to count on finding such approval. Esther certainly could not be confident the king would make an exception for her, for as she explained in her message, she had not been called into the king's presence for some thirty days. She could only assume her presence was, for whatever reason, not currently desired, and she would not be welcome if she intruded. It was clearly far too great a risk. Mordecai would surely understand that. Hatak dutifully reported Esther's words to Mordecai. They, the, the they in verse 12 probably indicates merely that as a chief attendant, Hatak was important enough to be accompanied by a 
by Aratunu of servants. In any case, Mordecai was informed of Esther's dilemma. Mordecai's challenge, Esther 4, 13-14. Mordecai's response was certainly not what Esther had been looking for. He did not even address the risk that she had so carefully explained to him. Instead, he made clear that she was already in danger, no matter what she what she did, and that she should not confront herself with any illusions that her position in the royal palace would shield her from the disaster looming over all the Jews throughout the empire. <coughs> Mordecai's words on this outcome became even more pointed. If Esther kept quiet in this perilous time, as her reply seemed to indicate she intended to do, deliverance for the Jews would emerge from some other quarter, but she and her relatives would die. Where did Mordecai get this sudden confidence about the deliverance from somewhere else? He certainly did not have specific information about other possibilities, Instead, he was expressing his faith that God had unlimited resources and would intervene in some way. He would not let his people be destroyed from the face of the earth. Mordecai expressed this faith without mentioning God's name specifically. It has been noted innumerable times over the years that God is not named anywhere in the book of Esther. Many have seen this as a deficiency and regard the story as a human-centered tale. But God's role and presence stand clearly discernible immediately behind the scenes, orchestrating events and providentially working out his will through people and circumstances. That was certainly Mordecai's understanding. He would have laughed at the notion that God was absent at this time. But Mordecai's message to Esther was nevertheless urgent. Her silence, her, her, silence, her failure to do her part, would ensure her own doom even if God delivered his people by some other means. Mordecai understood that the carrying out of God's sovereign will does not absolve or negate personal responsibility. It heightens it. Mordecai wanted Esther to consider one more crucial possibility. She no doubt assumed that she owed her exalted position as queen to her own beauty and the king's attraction to her. But perhaps she had been elevated to her position for some other reason. What if it was precisely for this perilous moment facing her people? Was her present status just for her own benefit? Or was it intended to serve a higher purpose? One that she would ignore to her own peril? Esther's decision. Esther 4, 15-17. To her great credit, Esther fully grasped the point of Mordecai's words and took them to heart. She sent back a reply to her cousin. Her message opened with an urgent request for Mordecai. She wanted him to assemble all the Jews living in Shushan and hold a fast together. They were to fast specifically for her aid, going without food and drink for three days and nights. Esther and her maids would do the same. The request for corporate fasting, likewise, refutes the notion of God's absence from the events of the book of Esther. The purpose of fasting was to seek God's favor and intervention, particularly in dire circumstances. Prayer is not specifically mentioned because it was, it was perfectly understood that prayer went hand in hand with fasting. Esther needed the support of prayer and fasting to give her strength and protection for what she was now determined to do. She would go into the king's presence despite the law against doing so. Her purpose, of course would be to plead the cause of her people, just as Mordecai had requested. Knowing the prayer support she would have as she approached the king, she no longer feared for her own safety. Her final comment in verse 16 has become immortal ever since. If I perish, I perish. Was Esther expressing a resigned fatalism here? So common to the pagan world of the ancients. That would seem to be an erroneous philosophy immediately following her plea for prayer and fasting. Rather, readers should see this statement as a sign that Esther now was given the grace to look beyond herself and her own concerns. She was carrying out a divine purpose and she was willing by faith to accept whatever outcome the Lord had in mind for her. 
Verse 17 quickly notes that Mordecai left the palace gate area and set about doing all that Esther had asked. The exchange of messages was over. Receiving the king's favor, chapter 5, verse 1. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house, verse 2. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, that she, was, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Esther's risk-laden approach, Esther 5.1. Three days later, Esther carried out her determination. Attired in her royal robe, she entered the inner court of the palace just across the king's hall. The king was seated on his royal throne facing the entrance. No one could enter the inner court unnoticed. Esther had passed the point of no return. All she could do now was wait for his reaction. The king's welcoming response, Esther 5.2. No one knows why the king had gone a month without requesting his king's presence. But when he saw her standing in the inner court, he was suddenly glad to see her. She obtained favor in his sight. He held out the golden scepter, and Esther approached and touched its tip. The immediate danger evaporated, and the blessing of the king's favor was now the reality she and all the Jews had hoped for. That favor would continue, as the succeeding chapters detail how Haman's plot unraveled and deliverance from the impending genocide was engineered. Through it all, the sure hand of God's control and working is evident. Questions 1. Where did Esther's attendant go to find Mordecai? 2. What information did Mordecai tell Hetak to, to lead up to his request? Three, what did Mordecai, speaking through Hatak, ask Esther to do? Four, of what did Esther want Mordecai to be aware of, to be aware why? Five, what did the king's extending of the golden scepter convey? Six, what did Mordecai suggest would happen to Esther if she played it safe and kept quiet? Seven, how was Mordecai so confident that God would save his Jews, save the Jews. Eight, what did Mordecai want Esther to especially consider regarding God's plans and her responsibility? Nine, what request did Esther have for Mordecai in return? Ten, what was Esther's new attitude toward the risk she would be taking? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, July 25th, 2021. Thank you for listening. God bless.